Good evening. I'm Patricia Van Skyke, Director of the Lloyd Library in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program, Planning for Your Pollinator Garden. The Lloyd Library was founded in the late 1800s with an emphasis on nature and medicine. Many think of us as a plant library, but early on our founders and the books in our collection, which go back hundreds of years, recognize that we live in an ecosystem and that plants and our overall wellness depend on that system. Accordingly, the Lloyd Library collection includes all aspects of nature, including insects. We also know from our survey that our viewers may be artists, scientists, or interested in history, but many are also gardeners. Tonight's program ties together the many aspects of our collection, as well as those who use us and attend our program. With that, I'd like to introduce Jenny O'Donnell, co-founder of the Queen City Pollinator Project and tonight, and partner in tonight's program. This group is making dramatic changes for the better. From my neighborhood where bees uh, that come from hives that they have helped establish visit my garden to across the world in France where they have shared their work. With that, I'd like to introduce Jenny O'Donnell. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Patricia. Thanks so much for having us here tonight. We're super excited. Um, I'll just give you a little background on Queen City Pollinator Project. It was born out of um, friendship that founders uh, Carrie Driehaus and myself formed over a beehive and a cup of coffee. And then we decided we need to make this, this relationship with the world bigger. So we formed a 501c3 with the goal of changing the world. Uh, we, don't, we don't think small in this organization. So soon after we uh, brought our amazing speaker this evening, Sylvana Ross in and um, she joined the call to action and the three of us are now BFFs. Um, we are three environmental activists who started by planting beehives on rooftops and milkweed in abandoned lots and really talking to anyone who would listen about what each of us can do to protect and support pollinators. We're focused on caring, caring for all pollinators and teaching others how, how they can join the effort. And that's gonna be the theme of, of tonight. Um, we've already made some splashes in Cincinnati and we're super excited about that. We've made some great partnerships and I have to tell you, I'm delighted about the partnership that we have with the Lloyd and Patricia, you know that you got this lovely letter from me just oozing excitement about being part of it. So thank you for that, for accepting us in. So with that, I want to first thank our dedicated board members and I want to invite anybody on the call to look us up at qcpp.org. Um, and now I am delighted to introduce to you Syl Ross, the nature boss, to plant some ideas that you can use in your own ecosystem. All right. Hey, guys. All right. Let me get my situated. All right. Thank you to the Lloyd. Uh, thanks, Jenny, for the wonderful introduction. Um, and so, like Jenny said, and like Patricia said, we are going to be talking about planning for your pollinator garden. And so to get started, just to tell you a little bit about moi. Um, I, my name is Sylvana Ross. And I graduated from the University of Cincinnati with a bachelor's in biology. And near the end of that, of, of my stint there, I actually ended up working in a jumping spider lab where we were studying mating behavior and jumping spider vision. And so once I got my hands dirty with that, I was like, oh, whoa, insects are super cool. And they provide these amazing behaviors and ecosystem services. And I just like wanted to get my hands dirty again with that. And so when I met with Carrie and we were teaching after school programs, um, we started taking pictures of like pollinators on flowers for our classes. And once you like zoom in on like a monarch on a flower and you're just like, whoa, like you can see all the cool colors, they're long proboscis going into a flower. And I was just, I was hooked. So just taking pictures and getting more curious about our environment kind of led us on this amazing journey to helping protect our pollinators. 
And so for today's presentation, we are going to be talking about how you can prepare your garden space, whether it's a yard or even just a pot for pollinators, and then not just the seeds and the flowers and the dirt that you'll need for starting your pollinator garden, but also the curiosity and the attitude and behaviors that you can look for in your yard. Um, and we'll kind of wrap up with some community engagement that you can do to kind of like further outreach toward protecting pollinators. Um, yeah, so let's get started. So a world with pollinators. So we're gonna start with um, what a pollinator is, right? So kind of throw it back to middle high school biology. Uh, so pollination is when an animal or insect is carrying pollen from the male part of the flower called the anther to the female part of the flower called the stigma. And so pollen is that thing that in early spring, if you start sneezing and your eyes start watering and your nose starts getting all clogged, um, it's probably your allergic reaction to pollen. And so a lot of pollen is wind pollinated, um, but we see a majority of, of flowering plants using pollinator services. So they're using insects such as bees and wasps and butterflies and moths and beetles, um, but they're also using some animals such as birds and bats. And so some insects and other pollinators are accidental, meaning that they're visiting a flower for nectar, which is like the red bull of the animal kingdom, right? If you're flying around trying to find a mate and find food and find shelter, you're gonna need energy. And so a lot of insects and animals need nectar to fuel themselves. And so when they're visiting a flower for that nectar, they'll brush up against the anther and get pollen on their bodies. And as they visit flower to flower, they'll deposit pollen, so they bless they are a pollinator. And then a lot of our bees are purposeful pollinators. So they're actually going to a flower to collect pollen to feed it to their young. And so because they're so specialized in getting that pollen, we see characteristics such as like really furry bodies. And so honeybees are really cool in the fact that they even have hair on their eyeballs and they even have structures on their legs to carry pollen called scopa. And so we all see these like really cool adaptations that bees have to collect pollen and not just the insects, but also the flowers themselves. And so flowers will have these intricate colors and patterns and to us it's like so beautiful and signs of love and appreciation um, but the flower has a goal for these colors and these patterns and it's to draw pollinators to the center of their flower or wherever their nectar or pollen is and so you can see we'll have these lines almost like a target to like draw pollinators in and so that specialized behavior can be dependent on a bee feeding their young or needing energy right um, and so I'll kind of cover a few common pollinators that you're going to see in your yard. Um, so I'd like to start off with honeybees. And we start off with honeybees because they're super popular, at, but they aren't native to North America. Sadly, they were brought over, I think, 1622s. Um, and we use them, of course, for honey, and we use them for beeswax and uh, propolis. But um, they aren't native to the United States, um, but they are naturalized, which means our ecosystems are very dependent on their pollination services. So we need them. Um, next up on the list are carpenter bees and they do get a bad rap. I bet there's someone out there that's like, oh, carpenter bees, uh, because they like to drill holes in our structures, especially like our porches and our decks and the siding of our houses. And to be fair, we're providing them a really great shelter that's probably a little bit better than what they can find out in nature. Um, but something that's really cool with carpenter bees is if you do have them, you can actually see the parasitic fly that will lay its eggs on carpenter bee larva. Um, and then that fly will emerge because it ate the larva. But the flies look actually really cool. They're like black and white Dalmatian-y looking flies. Um, but the next bee on our list are bumblebees. And bumblebees are also really common, especially in suburban and urban areas um, because they're generalists, meaning that they'll visit different types of flowers. They'll visit different types for pollen and nectar. Um, and bumblebees and carpenter bees get mixed up because they're both pretty big bees, but carpenter bees have a really shiny bottom and bumblebees have a really fuzzy bottom. And actually bumblebees are really gentle. Um, I like to go up and pet them because they're so fuzzy. Um, and if they don't like you petting them, they kind of just like throw up a little leg. Uh, but otherwise they're super sweet, really non-aggressive. Um, our next few bees are going to be our leaf cutter and mason bees. And I like to mention these guys because they're really common in suburban areas. Um, and they're really cool because they're cavity nesting bees. So if you ever see those um, bee houses, 
and we'll talk about them in a little bit. Uh, but they'll use little tunnels in wood that are already made by like beetles or maybe just like naturally there's a little hole in them where they'll lay their eggs and then they'll visit flowers for pollen and nectar and they'll make a little ball and then feed that to their larva and then they'll close up the entrance and then never see them again. And so leaf cutter bees, really cute. Um, they'll actually cut little leaf, parts of leaves out for their larva to build a little cocoon for them, kind of like leaf cutter ants. Um, and the mason bees, when they're building their chambers for their young, they actually use mud. Um, so they're called mason bees. Um, and then mining bees, um, a lot of different species of mining bees. They're super common in early spring. So there's some of our first bees around. Um, and they're ground nesting bees, which means they dig a tunnel in the ground. And that's where they're laying their eggs and leaving pollen and nectar for them and then closing off their tunnel and never seeing their young again. And so a majority of solitary bees are going to be ground nesting. And so they need the right soil, um, safe soil that isn't being moved around and tilled a bunch um, in order to have their young there safely. And so next we're gonna talk about some butterflies, our beautiful, beautiful butterflies. I kind of love the rap that butterflies have, like to the general public, they're these beautiful dainty insects that fly around with their beautiful colors. Um, and in reality, they're actually really gross. <laughs> they taste with their feet. Um, so they have their taste buds and their sensory organs on the bottoms of their feet. And so a lot of butterflies actually get need salt and nutrients. Um, and they get that from dead things and like poop. And so they'll visit, like if you've ever gone fishing and you like gut your fish there, you'll get a ton of butterflies on the leftovers because they need like the salts and minerals from that. Um, and so they'll visit them. So it's kind of gross, but they're <laughs> really cool. Um, and so they're also key pollinators because of their need for nectar. A a lot of adult butterflies are visiting flowers for that energy of nectar, especially our butterflies that are making migrations. So very popular monarchs that are making migrations from North America to Mexico. Um, they need nectar to help fuel that migration, to help fuel um, finding a mate and finding a place to lay their eggs. And so when we talk about butterflies, we tend to forget um, about their young. And so something that I think is really cool about butterflies is the way that their caterpillars look. And so um, real quick before we get to their caterpillars, um, just wanna cover a few of these gals. Uh, so monarchs of course are super popular because of their migration, um, but we are seeing a decline in their population because of the lack of milkweed that they need for their larva. And we'll definitely talk about host plants. Um, cabbage white butterflies are, actually one of the only butterflies known to be a pest species because as their name suggests, they lay their eggs on cabbage plants and so their larvae eat our cabbage. Um, so if you're gonna plant cabbage in your yard, you can expect cabbage white butterflies. And anytime you have like a butterfly whose caterpillar is eating your plants, I always recommend planting a little bit extra of it. So a little something for you, a little something for the butterfly. Uh, we have a very, we have a few species of swallowtails and they zebra, black, spice bush, pipe vine. Um, and we'll see in a second at the even though they're all swallowtails, um, their wings might look different and their caterpillars actually look different. Um, so yeah. And so when I say the intricate diversity of their caterpillars, it's actually mind blowing. It just, it blows my mind that an insect can look like something like this and then turn into a completely different looking insect with wings and different mouth parts. And it's, I don't even know. I love science and I don't even know how it happens, but it's it's insane. And so we have these caterpillars that are mimicking bird poop. So the giant swallowtail butterfly actually looks like bird droppings because if you're a predator, you probably don't want to eat bird poop. And so that's their way to disguise themselves because a lot of caterpillars don't really have these defenses. Um, here we have a Cercopia moth caterpillar. So even though it's a moth, I think it's super trippy just with all of its spikes and its different warning colors like hey do not put me in your mouth and it actually as it goes through its different instars so every time it sheds its skin um, it'll change its appearance a little bit um, we also see caterpillars mimicking seed pods so this cloudless sulfide caterpillar 
caterpillar mimics the seed pod of a wild senna plant. And so we even see that co-evolution where this butterfly has to lay its eggs, where its caterpillar is going to be able to disguise itself, right? And not only just disguise itself with the plant, but when that plant is having seeds. Um, another one that's really cool is the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail Caterpillar. Um, some of you might know that it looks pretty familiar because the Pokemon Caterpie is based off of the um, Black Swallowtail Caterpillar or the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail Caterpillar. Um, then we have the Black Swallowtail Caterpillar and this one will feed on its host plant is dill, parsley, fennel, and other kind of plants in the carrot family. But again, another another swallowtail with a completely different looking caterpillar. Um, pipe vine swallowtail caterpillars are also super trippy. I mean, the like dark black body with like the bright orange and red, um, they look super cool. And again, they're only eating pipe vine. And then I also wanted to mention real quick, their chrysalises are also really cool and intricate because when you're changing and morphing into a whole nother insect, you don't really have a lot of defenses. You can't defend yourself. You can't bite back. You can't fly away. Um, so a lot of chrysalises are camouflaged to look like tree bark, fallen leaves, um, to look like green so that they're hiding in leaves so that they don't get bothered or eaten. So and here are some other common pollinators that are native to Ohio and the Midwest. So the ruby-throated hummingbird is the only hummingbird species in Ohio. And as a beekeeper, hummingbirds are some of the first pollinators that are coming back in the early spring. And so the males actually are migrating back from Mexico, Costa Rica, or Panama. And so when they show up in Ohio, it's kind of like, it's my sign that, oh man, spring's here, get the bees out, everything's ready, get the camera, all the insects are about to come out. Um, and so hummingbirds are a great species, a great pollinator species. Um, if you ever have like a hummingbird feeder, um, those are great to help kind of boost their fuel for their migration. I mean, you see how fast their wings beat. They need a lot of energy. Um, wasps are near and dear to my heart. I know they're not in a lot of people's ours and that's okay, but the adults are actually feeding on flowers for nectar. And so they need that fuel to find food for their larva. And when they're visiting flowers, they're drinking the nectar, accidentally getting pollen on their bodies. Um, but when we see wasps at like our picnics and they're going for like our soda, they really want that sugar, right? To help fuel them. But if you see them going for like your chicken wings, they're getting that meat to feed their larva. And so the wasps are drinking nectar, the adult wasps are drinking nectar, but their larvae are the ones that are carnivores and eating meat. And so a lot of solitary wasps have hosts for their larvae. And so there are wasps that predate on caterpillars. So they'll actually steal, get a caterpillar, paralyze it, lay their egg on it, and leave their egg in a little nest underground um, for their larva to eat that caterpillar. They'll do that with other types of spiders and other types of insects. Um, so their life cycle and the way they parasitize things is super cool. And I could go into a whole other uh, soapbox on them. Um, so then I also want to mention hoverflies and flies. So hoverflies are a type of fly that are mimicking uh, wasps and bees, right? If you've got bright colors and a stinger, a lot of predators are like, that's enough signals for me to stay away from you. And so hoverflies take advantage of that. And so we can tell the difference between hoverflies and a regular bee because hoverflies have really big eyes and really short antenna. And they actually have one pair of wings, um, but they're convincing enough to a lot of predators to leave them alone. And then flies are also really important pollinators. Um, in fact, some species of flowers specifically try to attract flies to smell and they smell like really bad. So to us, they might smell like rotten fruit or something, um, but to the flies, that's amazing. And so they're attracted to those flowers. Beetles are extremely important pollinators, and in fact, they're thought to be some of the first pollinators. Um, millions of years ago, they, we can find beetles in amber with pollen grains on them, um, and so we'll see them on flowers because they're also taking advantage of the nectar and pollen. And then who can forget about moths? When I was a kid, I hated moths, terrified of them. Now I think they're absolutely crazy, intricate, and amazing. Um, but they're nocturnal, so we don't usually see them during the day, right? And so at night when they're looking for a mate, they need fuel, and so they'll visit flowers that are blooming at night. They'll visit white flowers that you can see better at night. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, so why do we even need pollinators? 
a lot of people are like, ugh, bugs, they got stingers, they might hurt me. Um, but we actually really need pollinators because they have co-evolved alongside flowering plants for over 150 million years. Um, so not just our world's flowers need them, but the hundred and the 1400 crop plants that are grown in the world, um, almost 80% of them require pollination services. So don't just think of your fruits and vegetables that you're eating, but think of the food that we feed our chickens, that we feed our cattle and our sheep. Um, all that food also gets pollinated by our pollinators. And so humanity depends on these pollinators to feed ourselves, right? And honeybees get a lot of that attention when it comes to pollinating our crops because we can manage them, we can move them from um, crop to crop. Um, they also give us, again, honey and beeswax. And that tends to then have our native solitary bees overlooked for agricultural services. But studies have shown that our native solitary bees are doing a majority of our pollinating our agriculture crops. And so when we spray pesticides on our crops and we mess with the soil and the water, um, we're also kind of messing with the balance of our native pollinators. And so we're seeing the impacts of decreasing biodiversity and native pollinator decline on our crop yields. And so why do our ecosystems need pollinators, right? Not just humans, step away from humanity for a little bit. And there's other insects and organisms that depend on pollinators as well. And so they're not only providing a pollination service, so they're not just helping plants reproduce, but they're also prey for really important species of birds and spiders and small mammals and other types of pollinators. Um, many solitary wasps need those caterpillars and spiders to host their larvae. And a lot of pollinators are ecosystem engineers, right? They build their shelter for young. They'll alter the soil structure when they're building tunnels. They'll provide new shelter for other insects. So when they dig holes in wood to lay their larva, um, next go around, you might have beetles living there and beneficial fungi and bacteria will live in them. Um, and so they're providing these other ecosystem services. And so the plants that they're also pollinating are help aerating, by cycling CO2, they're impacting those soil health. And so, and these plants are building relationships with fungi and microorganisms in the soil that help other insects like decomposers, like worms and beetles. And so this extremely intricate web um, that they're a part of is super important for the health and status of our ecosystems. And so when we see pollinators declining or when we see populations changing their ranges, um, it can be an indicator of how our ecosystem's biodiversity is doing and how the health of our land is doing, right? And so pollinators are in danger. And to what extent, we don't even quite fully know, but it's no secret that insect populations are declining, biodiversity around the world is being threatened. And so that has a major topic of concern for the future of how we feed ourselves, for the future of biodiversity, for the future of other organisms. And so things like habitat destruction, so when we're building highways and cities and factories and you name it, um, we're destroying plants that a lot of insects feed on, that they nest on. And so when we think about like solitary bees, they can't fly very far. Um, honeybees and bumblebees can typically fly, fly a few miles to find food. A lot of our solitary bees and native insects can't fly that far. Um, and so they're really dependent on where their food is and making sure that their nesting is close to that food. Um, invasive species are taking away resources from the native species that are here. Um, so I'm not a native Ohioan, and I know when I moved to Ohio, when spring was about, I was driving down the highway, and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so green. Like, look at all the green plants that are along the highway. This is incredible. And then I learned about honeysuckle. And if you're from Ohio, you know how much of a problem honeysuckle is. And then I was like, once I learned what the flowers look like, as I'm driving throughout spring, and then the flowers are blooming I'm like oh my gosh all this green along the highway is honeysuckle and it's just like miles of honeysuckle but um and it's not native to Ohio and so it's taking away resources from our native plants so it's taking not just space but it's taking sunlight and soil resources it's taking away pollination services um and that's taking away from the native plants that have been here for thousands of millions of years 
Um, things like pesticides and insecticides are showing effect not just on the plant or insect that they're targeting, but it affects the soil, it affects the pollen and the nectar in that plant. Um, and some neonicotinoids, which is a type of pesticide, have been found in the soil around a treated area up to years after it's been applied. So it's not just a momentary problem, but something that's long term. Um, monoculture, again, is a can be a problem for a lot of our native species. So we know that a lot of native bees are pollinating a lot of our crops. Um, but if there's only one type of crop that it's pollinating, then that doesn't give it a wide variety in its diet. Um, it also limits the food availability because if it's just one crop, it means it blooms at one time of the year. Um, so you get a bunch of food for a few weeks and then you get no food at all. And then of course, climate change, um, not just increasing global temperatures, um, but also stronger weather events. So things like longer droughts, wildfires, floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, a lot of our native species aren't adapted to survive all of these events and the increasing frequency of these events. Um, I also like to pinpoint on environmental policies, right? If we, sometimes it gets really daunting and you can get anxious on, just the future of our, our environment and you know, thinking as an individual, like what can I do that's gonna impact everyone, but um, being a champion for your local policies that can affect the way that we manage your own city. Um, I love the quote, I think Robert Downey Jr. actually said it, but think locally and act like, or, oh my gosh, act locally, think globally, so acting on your environmental policies locally. So who's, how are you collecting your trash? Um, I've actually got family in Oregon and it's really cool that their trash department picks up not just their trash and recycling, but also their compost. And then they give the compost to the community gardens, right? Like that's so cool, but that's one of their like local government policies. Um, and then again, there's a lot of lack of research on our solitary bees, on our native pollinators, um, just because a lot of those research does go to honeybees and bumblebees, just because they do, we think of them as this agricultural service. Um, but our native and solitary bees are facing problems that we don't really know the full effect of because we don't know exactly how they're doing, right? We don't have numbers on how their populations are doing in our cities and in suburbia and in the areas around it. Um, so if we don't even know how they're doing, we can't really help them, right? So getting more involved in scientific research too, which we'll talk about. Um, and so real quick, why are you important? So you can help pollinators and even as an individual. And so I'm coming to you as someone that lives in an apartment. I don't have control over the small patch of grass by my door, um, but there are ways that you can help your pollinators as well. And so when do you see your garden as an ecosystem and as a space, almost like a stage for all these really cool interactions um, that are happening, then you start developing like a curiosity for these insects and organisms. And then that kind of leads to empathy. And so then you kind of empathize with these organisms and you want to spend your time caring and managing that space appropriately. And so I like to think of it as you are the Lorax of your garden, right? The bees don't speak, the plants don't speak, the spiders can't speak, um, but you can. And so you can provide, you're the one that's providing um, access to food, availability of water. You're the one that can control the presence of different chemicals in your garden. And so when you're practicing pollinator friendly techniques, you're not just benefiting the pollinators, but you're benefiting all the other insects and organisms that are also playing a role in your ecosystem, right? All right, so now to the juicy bits. Um, talking about different space. So in order to plan for your garden, you need to assess what kind of space that you have and make the most of it, right? So some space constraints that can be a problem is not having space at all. So like I said, this, this is actually this bottom um, right picture is the little green space by my apartment. Um, featuring my cat. Um, but again, it's like covered in the shade. The soil is really gross. Um, I don't have control over it. So it's not my, I don't own that land. Um, but this is the very start of it. I can plant things in little pots and we'll kind of talk about that. But yeah, so poor soil, again, Ohio and Kentucky are known for ha having really clay filled soil. 
Um, some of our native plants are used to that. Some of our native plants need a little bit more of a mix of clay and loamy soil. Um, so poor soil, and not just with clay, but also it can be riddled with pesticides. Like I said, some pesticides have been shown to be in the uh, ground up to years afterwards. So even if you didn't spray pesticides or have an effect on that, um, runoff can have a built, um, an effect. Also poor drainage. Uh, so yeah, having poor soil, access to water, which is kind of interesting. Um, for me, again, in my apartment, I'd have to fill up my pot of water in my sink and take it outside. Some people have access to sprinklers or a hose. Um, and then thinking about like in your yard, if it rains, does water pool up in this particular spot? Does there, is there a spot in your yard that doesn't get any water? Um, and then thinking about time and money, which are very, I think are some of the two very important things on how we adapt our gardens, right? So do you have the time, not just to establish a garden, but to maintain it? And so, you know, building garden, putting, getting it ready takes time and then managing it also takes time. And then money, right? Creating a budget for your garden is a great way to start, is a good spot to start as you're working your way to picking out what plants. Um, we'll talk about if you need to start seeds versus get, buying a plant and establishing it. Um, and so thinking about if you'll need soil testing or like where you'll get your plants from. Right. And some other space constraints. Um, if you have kids or pets, like would you want kids to be involved in your garden? Do you want to make sure that your dog stays out of your garden? Um, we'll talk about establishing like a sandy or like a empty soil spot for native ground nesting bees. But if you live in an area where you have a lot of stray cats, you might get some stray cats that might use your area for solitary bees as a bathroom. So, you know, what kind of um, animals and other mammals are visiting your yard? Also thinking about shade and sun, um, how much shade will that your yard get or wherever you wanna put your pollinator garden? Um, and then long-term, are there trees that are gonna be blocking the sunlight in the future? Um, are you gonna be establishing fencing, anything like that? Um, so here are some solutions for those spaces. So I love to advocate for raised beds and pots because that kind of helps you control the soil. So for me, again, like the soil by my place, it's trash <laughs> and I am not a soil expert. So having pots and like something that I can control the soil content is beautiful. Mwah, love it. Um, and they're way easier to keep weeds out. And it's great for temporary housing. So like they're, because they're portable, you can move them around. Um, also joining a community garden. So places um, like garden centers might ha have uh, raised beds that you can rent out. So you can make your vegetable garden or a pollinator space there. And then also keeping one with a friend helps minimize costs and makes it better for like time management, especially if like you can't get there like a once a week or so, you can have like a friend help you out. And it's always like fun to do stuff with a friend. <laughs> um, some other space solutions. So sometimes you can feel really overwhelmed if you have too much space, right? Like I have all this space, like I wanna make sure that I help all the pollinators and what can I do? And that's a lot of money to control that much space. And so always like, it's okay, start small. You can start a, a small little oasis by starting a small pollinator garden there. Um, and always think about where you can dedicate space, right? If you have a really shady area um, or somewhere where you know the soil is not that great, you can start a compost there or or it's where you can place insect hotels, like those little native bee houses. Um, and insect hotels along with like adding sticks and branches and twigs so that other insects can have shelter there and lay their eggs and stuff. Um, and then also adding space for like a sensory garden. So not just for young kids, but like I think it's really cool to have different textured plants that you can feel and different things that you can smell. So having different types of herbs that smell different. Um, having like lamb's ear is a type of plant that actually it feels oh, so soft. And actually wool carpenter bees will use the fuzziness of lamb's ear to help build their space for their larva. Um, having things like sand and mulch and stones, um, flowers of different shapes and colors um, are really cool to see the different types of pollinators that also visit those flowers, which we'll kind of talk about in a bit. All right. 
So to seed or not to seed, sometimes you might get the urge to want to watch a seed grow from a little tiny thing and sprout through the soil and turn into this beautiful plant. And so there's some pros and cons to whether you buy your own seeds and germinate them and germinate them over the winter or whether you buy like an established plant in the spring. And so when you start your own seeds, you have to think about you'll need um, lighting equipment and the actual indoor space to grow them. And so as, again, as seeds get a little bit bigger and as their sprouts grow, um, you're gonna need to like up their room. And so there are some plants that are really easy to start. So if you're thinking about starting seeds, but you don't wanna dedicate your entire garden to seeds, um, starting with plants like zinnias and basil and marigolds and sunflowers, they're really easy to start inside. Um, and so first thing you wanna do is plan, right? What kind of plants do you wanna start from seed. Um, again, it takes experience, it takes time to figure it out. Um, so again, starting easy. Um, so you'll need the timing right. Usually about six to eight weeks before the first frost date is when you're going to start your seeds. And so in Ohio, the first frost date is usually around the first or second week of May in, in Ohio. Um, then you're going to want to prep the container, any like a little small, like you'll see the small seed beds and you'll put seeds about two to three inches of depth and you want to make sure that the things have drainage um, and you always want to use fresh potting soil and then when you plant you're going to plant the seeds you want to make sure you feed and water them and so some seeds will have instructions on like fertilizing um, I didn't invest in like a little spray pump because seeds don't necessarily need a ton of water right away and so getting something to spray them with at the beginning will help keep the soil mo moist um, Again, when we're thinking about seeds, thinking about time commitment, right? You're gonna have to spritz some seeds and make sure that the lighting's right, uh, make sure that the lighting and timing's right. So do you have the time to do that? Um, so when it comes to lighting, you can get like a timer. I've actually found timers at the pet store for like reptile lights and stuff. So you can attach that to lights if you have them. Um, or if you wanna set them in a window, you wanna make sure it's a south facing window. And then about a week before you plan to put your seeds into the ground, you'll need to kind of break them into the weather. So you have to take them outside for a few hours, bring them in at night, and then in about a week, they can get more acclimated to outside weather, and then you can sow them. Um, there's some really great resources out there too, specifically for type different types of seeds. Um, usually the seed packet itself will have the information on how to start it. Um, Burpee.com is also a great resource for on learning when to plant the seeds. So it'll tell you, depending on the zone that you're in, the type of flower or seed that you're using, um, and it'll give you kind of like instructions as well. And another pro to using seeds is that seeds are a lot cheaper than an established plant, um, but they do require a lot more time commitment. But they're also really cool to watch grow, right? And so if buying plants is more your speed, which can be a lot of people's speed, um, they are more expensive to buy, but again, saves you a lot of time and indoor space. And then if you run in, you may run into hybrids, which means that you can't plant the seeds that they create because they won't be sterile, um, which makes it harder to save seeds for next year as a cost-effective method. But if that's what you want to do, um, uh, then it's a lot easier to start out and you can play it ear by ear with the weather as well right so that way like because our weather is changing in Ohio has some really like sporadic weather um kind of having to plan on the frost date can get a little wonky so if you buy an already established plant it kind of gives you a little leeway with weather changes all right so now we'll be talking about space for pollinators right so what do pollinators need um, they need shelter for young, water, and food, just like a lot of other organisms needs in their environment. And so shelter for young in the form of something that can protect their young. A lot of uh, bees will need somewhere that they can lay their egg and provide them pollen and nectar. Again, a lot of butterflies have host plants where they have to lay their eggs on that plant. Water is really important. Um, stay hydrated, friends, because they need water just as much as we do. Um, bees and uh, a lot of butterflies actually like dirty water. And we'll talk about that in a second. And then food, of course, right, in the form of nectar if you're an adult, um, in the form of pollen if you're a larva, in the form of eating leaves if you're a caterpillar. Um, so yeah. 
And so talking about native bee habitat, so a majority, a large majority of our native bees are solitary, which means they do not have a queen, they don't hang out with their sisters, they don't take care of their young, it's usually just a female who makes a nest, she lays her egg, she gives them food, and then dips. Like She's like, I'm never going to see you turn into an adult, here's some food, good luck. And so a lot of our native bees are ground nesting, and when we think of ground nesting bees, I get a lot of questions about like, oh, I like mowed my lawn and these ground nesting bees came out and were like bumping me and trying to sting me. Probably wasps. I guarantee you they're wasps. If there's more than one, it's probably a wasp. And so the yellow jackets are the ones that are underground. Um, and actually, if you're going to mow and you've got yellow jackets and you don't want to spray them, you can always block their entrance with like a brick or something and mow and then remove it at night when they've calmed down. Um, but I know that they are a problem. Again, it's your ecosystem, your habitat, you're in control of what's going on. Um, but a lot of our native bees are extremely non-aggressive. Um, they are building those tunnels. You might even find them in your lawn. Um, usually they need certain types of soil. So like sandy or loamy, something that they can actually dig into. And so they'll need that to where their eggs can um, mature where they can then eat the pollen and nectar that their mom leaves them and then emerge as an adult either that same season or the following spring. Um, and then cavity nesting bees like our uh, leaf cutters and mason bees will use hollow stems and even like beetle burrows, any small holes in wood um, in order to lay their eggs. And so something really cool that I think they do. So this top one over here is from a leaf cutter bee. And so again, they're cutting those leaves out of especially like rose bushes and stuff, but they'll make their tunnels and cocoons out of them for their larva. And then below it is actually from a resin bee. So they'll take tree sap and resin and they'll build these chambers for their young. And then mason bees here on the bottom will actually use mud to chamber off for each egg. So they will usually lay one egg per chamber, leave a ball of pollen and nectar, larva will eat that, and then they'll emerge in the spring. And something really cool a lot of these species do, will they'll lay males in the front and females in the back because the males will emerge first. So they don't like bother the females or chew their way through the females, um, which is pretty cool. And so butterflies also need a habitat, right? And so these adult butterflies and moths will drink nectar to help fuel them, but their uh, larvae need a specific type of plant to eat. And so we call that nectar versus host plant. So the nectar plant is providing fuel for the butterfly. So we see butterflies on all different types of flowers, uh, but their host plant is the one that is needing uh, their larva to eat from. Um, so the nectar, again, is providing energy. The host plant is the fuel for their larva. And so a big problem with declining monarch populations is the lack of milkweed available. And so monarchs can visit a wide variety of flowers for nectar for the adults, but their larva need milkweed to eat off of um, because that milkweed gives them protection in the form of being poisonous to their predators. And so when we when they're making their large migration from Mexico back up north, they need, again, fuel to help fuel that migration. And if they're having a hard time finding nectar plants, and if they're having a hard time finding milkweed to lay their eggs, that's contributing to the decrease of their population. Right. Um, so I kind of wanted to throw this in here because I think it's really cool. So other habitats that we typically don't think as habitats, um, are things that a lot of parasitoid wasps will use. So solitary wasps can be known as parasites because they'll lay their eggs in caterpillars, on spiders. And so they need, for their young, their habitat are these other organisms. And so providing a habitat that might attract caterpillars and you're like, oh, this caterpillar is eating all my tomato plants give it like a week or so and you might find that a uh, wasp actually laid its eggs within a caterpillar and actually the this uh, tomato hornworm which is really common on tomato plants and if you've ever tried to grow tomato plants you've probably seen these types of caterpillars um, but there is a type of wasp that predates on them and they'll lay their eggs within the caterpillar and then once the larva will actually eat the caterpillar on the inside and then once they're ready to pupate they'll emerge from the caterpillar and make these cocoons on the outside um, 
super wicked like the animal kingdom is wild um but it's a really good way to kind of like the checks and balances of our ecosystem right we have this pest and there's actually a wasp that will predate on it um and then there's wasps that will use like spiders and other caterpillars will they'll paralyze them and then drag them into a little hole in the ground and lay their egg on it and so they paralyze it in order to keep that fresh for their egg and then their larva will then eat that organism as it grows so yeah, so really important again for our wasp life cycle to help check pest insects. Um, so that's really important that we keep them safe as well. All right, so providing water uh, for pollinators. Um, it's really important again, keeping hydrated. Um, pollinators need a safe spot for water. And so a lot of bees might drown in like bird baths and in ponds, even though they need that water to survive. So even if you can't have any space for any type of flowering plant at all, you can provide a water dish. And so putting like a little, like the bottom of a pot or just a little dish with some stones in it and then filling it up with water will attract pollinators and they can drink water that way and they won't drown. So they can like stand on these little rocks um, so they don't drown. And they actually really like dirty water because that releases some of the minerals in the dirt that they typically wouldn't get from just visiting a flower and drinking its nectar and getting its pollen and that they have a hard time accessing throughout the their ecosystem. Um, if you do have a bird bath, you can try popping like wine corks in it that float so they can have something to stand on and it like looks really trendy and cool to have little wine corks in your bird bath. Um, but yeah, it helps them so they don't drown. And so flowers as a food source, again, um, it's really cool how flowers have co-evolved alongside pollinators and pollinators have co-evolved alongside flowers because they have all these unique adaptations to attract pollinators to help spread their pollen, right? And so kind of as you're planning your pollinator garden, it is kind of cool to think about like, oh, what kind of pollinators are gonna take advantage of this flower? And I wonder how this flower is attracting this pollinator. Um, so flowers use different colors. Um, and so to us, like, this is something I just, I think is really cool. So like dandelions, for example, um, to us, they look yellow because we see a certain range in the color spectrum, in light spectrum. Um, a lot of insects actually see further than we do into the UV. And so to a lot of insects, this yellow dandelion actually has a target in the center of its flower. And so as a bee is flying, it's like, oh, boom, that's where the nectar and pollen is like. And so these petals that a lot of uh, flowers have are more of like an attraction to get insects to their pollen and nectar at the center of their flower. Um, we also see in the in flower shapes. So long tubular flowers are really good for pollinators with really long tongues and really long proboscis. Um, we also see ones that are flat. So flowers that have flat surfaces are great for insects that can't like hover. So beetles and flies, they can have somewhere to land. Um, and this really cool story of this like co-evolution between flowers and insects. Um, this flower is called a star orchid and it's actually found in Madagascar. And so the 1860s, good old Charles Darwin um, predicted that this flower has to have a pollinator that could reach its nectar because its nectar is all the way down here in these nectarines. And so Darwin was like, there has to be an insect out there with a tongue long enough to get that nectar. Cause they're, they're like, why would it even do that? Um, and he was actually ridiculed. People were like, Darwin, dude, like nothing has a tongue that long. That's insane. Um, and it wasn't until about 40 years later that scientists discovered a sphinx moth with about a foot long proboscis that was found pollinating on this particular orchid because it could reach the nectar at the very bottom. So good job, Darwin. Um, and again, things like smell also appeal to a lot of pollinators. Um, like I mentioned before, some flowers might even smell gross to us, but that attracts flies. And so a lot of our insects are using their antenna to help sense the flowers um, to help lure them in. There's even flowers that release like pheromones that trick male bees into thinking that that flower is a female bee. And so that male bee will go to the flower thinking it's a female and then pollinate the flower. Um, so it's honestly, I think it's really cool. All right, so getting into what kind of plants you should plant for your pollinator garden. Um, I'm going to focus on some native varieties of flowers, um, specifically native to Ohio. 
Um, but when you're thinking about the plants and the flowers that you want to incorporate into your garden, um, you're going to want to think about flowers that bloom at different times. So a variety of flowers, some that bloom in the spring, some that bloom in the summer, and that some are blooming in the fall. And so providing these variety of flowers throughout the year ensures that you're helping different types of pollinator species because some are specialists. So they'll come out at certain times of the year because the flower that they use to feed their young is only blooming at that time of the year. Um, you also have pollinators like bumblebees and some butterflies and honeybees that are out throughout the entire growing season that need food all the way from like early spring all the way to like October. Um, and then also planting different types of host plants along with your vegetable garden um, can also help ensure even though if you're specifically focused on planting for vegetables, um, having some like host plants on the outside or planting extra like extra cabbage or extra parsley, extra fennel uh, can provide food resources for butterflies, caterpillars, and you still get the food that you want out of it. So some spring blooming plants that are native to Ohio that are great for pollinators. Um, I didn't even think about this, but Lenten rose is a great one. It doesn't look super appealing, and but they're some, they bloom in really early spring. And so a lot of our early pollinators like bumblebee queens that are super early spring emergers, um, mining bees um, are feeding off of Lenten roses. Same with daffodils, all those bulb plant, um, bulb flowers that come out in early spring. Virginia bluebells look really cool. Um, catmint, um, beautiful, it'll grow, it blooms in the spring. Uh, lilac bushes are also great. Hyacinths, um, red bud trees, and crab apples. Um, I don't want to discourage anyone from planting trees because um, they also provide a lot of food resources all at once, but uh, imagine how many flowers a crab apple tree produces, right? So that's a lot of food. Um, we'll quickly breeze through this because we're running out of time, but some summer blooming plants. Um, button bush looks real trippy, but it's great for bees and flies and butterflies. Um, dill, fennel, and thyme are some host plants that are great for some swallowtails. Um, and it's also a great pollinator or nectar plant once it goes to flower. Uh, butterfly bush, another great nectar resource. Ornamental onion actually looks really cool and all those like individual flowers. Sunflowers, they're providing a bunch of pollen and the large varieties. There's even smaller varieties if you don't want a 12 foot flower growing in your yard. There are smaller like growing varieties. Um, and something really cool with sunflowers is that the petals may look like one flower, but in the middle of the flower, all these little anthers are actually from individual flowers surrounded by these really big petals. And so it's actually hundreds of little flowers within that one big sunflower. Um, zinnias, really easy to grow by seed um, in beautiful colors. Um, milkweed, again, spot on plant, a really great nectar plant as well as a host plant for monarchs. Um, and then cone flowers. Real quick, some other summer plants that are great for pollinators, common mallow, uh, thistle, Russian sage, cosmos are really easy to grow from seed. Um, mints, I would recommend if you're gonna grow mint because it's invasive and it will grow super fast, keep it in like a pot because it will grow everywhere. Um, but again, when you're growing herbs, think about keeping them long enough to let them grow to uh, to flower so that they can provide be a nectar source as well. Um, and then here's some fall blooming plants. So ones that are going to be blooming in fall that are going to provide food res resources for our late pollinators. Um, asters are amazing food resources. Goldenrod, you might see goldenrod when you're driving down the highway, those like small yellow flowers. Um, as a beekeeper, we can actually yeah, you can kind of smell the honey change when goldenrod starts coming about and you're like, ah, this is the goldenrod honey. Um, ironweed, salvia, scarlet milkweed, um, passion flowers, actually really cool to watch insects pollinate passion flowers because the nectar is at the base here. The bee has to go in, drink the nectar, and then the pollen, the anthers are up here. And so it actually gets the pollen on its back. So all this yellow on this carpenter bee's back is from pollen from the passion flower. So as it's drinking nectar, it gets pollen and then it deposits it up here. So it's actually really cool. And the flowers are like real weird looking. <laughs> it's great that you can grow in Ohio. Um, and then perennial sunflowers as well. And then 
real quick are some shade loving plants. And so again, I am in an area where I buy the back area gets like no sun. And so things like columbine and scarlet bee balm, cardinal, cardinal flowers, love shade, um, poke milkweed. So then you're supporting monarchs as well as if you don't have as much of a sunny area, um, darf larkspur, blue bell, uh, bell flowers, all great shade native plants. And then I really want to get on a quick soapbox about leaving some weeds. Um, weeds have been shown to be amazing pollinator resources for food, for nectar and pollen. So leaving things like dandelions, dandelions are some of the first flowers to bloom and some of the last ones to still be blooming at the end of the growing season. And so I know there can be a pain to gardeners, but if you have like a spot where you can leave some dandelions or you have like an area where it's all right to let them grow a little bit, um, it'd be amazing. Same with clover. We see a lot of clover in like our front lawns um, and dead needles and violets, jewel weeds and spring beauties. Again, great pollinator resources that typically we'll try and pull because it makes our garden look messy. But if you're doing something like mowing your lawn only like once a month or every couple few weeks, it's less work for you and it's good for the pollinator. So it's like win, win, win. Um, and then I'll kind of shoot this through real quick. Um, some more really good nectar plants. Again, asters, goldenrod, sunflowers, clovers and thistles, um, black-eyed Susans and zinnias. So these are all really great nectar resources. They're easy to grow. Um, they have a lot of different flowers. So um, it provides a lot of resources for our pollinators. And then some more specific butterfly host plants. Again, milkweed for our monarchs. Spice bush is great for spice bush swallowtails. Anything in the carrot family is going to be great for black swallowtails. Um, violets are great for variegated and great spangled fritillaries. Again, pipe vine for pipe vine swallowtails. And then thistle and hollyhocks for painted ladies. Um, so yeah. So now we're going to be talking about, real quick, just some ways that you can manage your garden to make sure that we're promoting healthy pollinator habitats. And so I bet you've probably heard the spiel of like not spraying pesticides in your yard. So not only do we know that pesticides harm the insects that are visiting them, but it affects the soil, it affects the other plants around them. And there isn't a ton of research on how pesticides are affecting our solitary and native bees. So if we don't know, it's better to just not spray at all. Um, if you have to spray, which is okay, I get it. If you have to spray, try spraying in the evening when a lot of our pollinators are asleep, sorry moths, but um, try and spray at night and then covering those flowers or that area with the tarp. That way pollinators that are trying to visit the flowers don't have any interaction with that pesticide for a few hours. Um, another solution to limit unwanted insects in your garden is to use a little bit of mulch where you don't want your insects digging holes, um, but always try and leave a little sandy patch or a little area of bare so soil for our ground nesting bees and other ground nesting insects. Um, again, think about if you do have stray cats around your neighborhood, because I know that can be a problem, stray cats using that as a bathroom. Um, and so now that we're going up to spring, when you're cleaning up your garden, try and leave as many leaves as possible for as long as you can. Because like this chrysalis here, it's trying to mimic the dead leaves. And a lot of um, butterflies will overwinter in their pupil stage. So when they're in their chrysalis or cocoon, um, that's what they're overwintering. And they're overwintering in the leaf litter and underground. So trying to leave that until the it gets about 50 degrees consecutively for seven days. And that's kind of their wake up call. And that's when you can start collecting um, your leaves again. And then if you have to mulch, try not to mulch your garden, but if you do, wait until the soil dries out some and then the weather is consistently warmer. Again, there's things nesting in the ground right now. And as it's winter, and we're all like, I'm hibernating. I think I'm hibernating. Um, but once the weather starts warming up, things that are staying underground are gonna start emerging. Um, and again, when you're pruning your plants, watch out for chrysalises and cocoons when you're pruning. Um, there's actually a swallowtail caterpillar within this like leaf and they'll curl them up um, as shelter. All right. 
So last but not least, how you can get involved in your community, right? So I love, I love, love, love the idea of community science, right? That anybody can get involved in contributing scientific data to our greater knowledge pool. And so anything that you can share, right? So your observations are so important to science. Like scientists cannot visit every single yard and every single spot all over the country. Like it's, we don't have the manpower, they don't have the money, <laughs> it's impossible. But we also don't have a lot of information on our native species. So we need the observations of anyone that can take a picture of the native plants, of the insects that are visiting those plants. You can upload them to apps such as iNaturalist or Seek. And actually with um, apps like iNaturalist, when you upload your image or you upload your insect or plant, um, there are other scientists that can go on and help identify that plant or insect. And then once it gets a research grade marking, it can actually goes into a database for scientists so that they can say like, oh, I can see the percentage of bumblebees or um, agapostum bees that are in this area. And so that's really important that you are the eyes and ears of science. And again, you're the Lorax of your ecosystem. You have to speak for your ecosystem. And so letting science know what's in your yard and can also help scientists know what's not in our neighborhoods and what, um, is lacking in our areas. And so some really cool programs um, such as Bumblebee Watch. Uh, we do have a couple endangered species of bumblebees that scientists are trying to monitor. Um, Bee Wise Honeybee Pollen and Nectar Map. It helps us map out the pollen and nectar resources. Um, so by taking pictures of nectar plants, so literally anything that a pollinator is going to get nectar and pollen from, um, can help us identify the diversity of these nectar and um, host plants. And then Monarch Watch is a really cool program that help us track monarchs. And so something that we do with some of our students is you can catch monarchs and you can place a little tag on their wings. And so when that generation is migrating to Mexico, there are scientists in Mexico that can collect those monarchs um, and see if they made it. And so we can say like, hey, this monarch came from West Virginia or this one came from Ohio. Um, so that's a really cool project to help monitor really important species. And I, mean, I really advocate for getting to know what's in your ecosystem, right? Get to know what's in your backyard, who's visiting your flowers. Um, honeybees can fly up to two miles from their hive to look for pollen and nectar. So what you do in your yard is going to affect what happens to bees that are two miles away. And so we have hives that are in Evanston and like downtown Cincinnati. And we know that our hives aren't just gonna be around that area. They're gonna be flying downtown. They're gonna be flying to people's yards. And so what you do in your yard is important important to the pollinators that are visiting it. And so if you know that there are areas around you that are people are spraying pesticides, you know, try and advocate for your community, advocate for the pollinators that are visiting your yard, um, that spraying pesticides can have a detrimental effect on their population and on their health. And then taking the time to observe what's in your neighborhood, what's in your ecosystem, what kind of insects are visiting your flowers. And over the years, um, we can build support for future generations to kind of understand what other pollinators and beneficial insects and animals are visiting um, our urban spaces. All right, and then a few resources for you that you can visit online. Um, American Meadows is a great website for flower seeds. Burpee, I had mentioned before, again, looking up for flower seeds and like how to take care of them, when to plant them, when to sow them. Um, they're great for that. Uh, what else? Garden Alive is in Fairfield, Ohio. They do local lawn care garden supplies. Bee Haven is a really great local shop where she's a local beekeeper and she knows all things about like honey and honeycomb. Uh, Keystone Flora is also in Cincinnati. Uh, they grow and sell native plants. And so you can ask them about any native plant that you need. Um, Girl Next Door Honey is great information on backyard beekeeping. Uh, if you really want to know more about like native bees, especially mason bees, osmia bee. Um, and then Green Umbrella is a great uh, sustainability program that is focused on creating Cincinnati as a green city. So those are some really cool resources to look into. Um, some other things, because if you're like me and you really like listening to stuff, there's some really cool podcasts out there. So Pollination is about a pollinator health. And so they'll have different um, 
people that are experts in pollination on nature guys podcast is a great local podcast um and there are a few books like butterflies of ohio um, i know when i was growing up we had like a bird book so anytime we'd see birds on our feeder we'd mark off what kind of birds we saw so that's really cool with like butterflies um the bees in your backyard is like my bee bible it has like all the information on north american bees and the types of bees that you'll see when you'll see them and their life cycles and all that um, vegetables love flowers also a really good book about if you're vegetable gardening what kind of flowers to also incorporate into your garden that can help benefit both of those um, and then newcomb's wildflower guide is a great book to help identify some wild wildflowers all right so i know i'm like right on the cusp of time um, so I just want to say thank you guys so much for joining my presentation. Um, and if you have any questions or like want to reach out or you just want to like know some bee or wasp facts or you just want to talk about bugs, um, you can visit us on Facebook. Um, we also have a website and you can also email us. Uh, but we are always looking for volunteers to help us with some of our pollinator gardens that we have around the city. Um, we do a lot of educational programs like this, and we also talk to a lot of students, um, especially in our city schools where nature isn't always provided for them or they're told that they can't go to nature when and we try to help them see that nature is like right outside and it's right in our backyards. Um, but yeah, so if anyone has any questions, um, we can, I'll take them, but thank you. All right. Thank you, Syl, that was absolutely fascinating. I think it was one of the best descriptions I've ever heard of the interconnectedness and the importance of biodiversity explained through pollinators. I just learned so much and there were so many resources that you gave us. Um, one of the things that I really liked was your emphasis on community because, um, you know, the study of botany has uh, a strong foundation in citizen scientists. So it's so great that we're able to continue to do that today. And also that um, it's so much easier with apps and all sorts of technology to assist with that. Um, I was sort of interested in, um, or one thing that I found really profound was uh, the emphasis on laying eggs, a place for the eggs to land. I, a lot of times when I hear about pollination and pollinators, we hear about the feeding and we hear about the landing, but that egg laying sounds like that's pretty crucial. Oh, yeah. Um, we do have a question from Nancy. Um, the best host for red admiral butterflies. Hmm, I did see that. I'm not quite sure. And that's a really good question. And actually, I can use the computer in my hands to look it up. But I don't know it off the top of my noggin. Um, but again, if not necessarily knowing for host plants, even providing just like nectar plants. So something that that butterfly can eat um, to give it energy to find its host plant is just as well. So, um, but yeah, I'm not quite sure on that one. So um, we do have somebody that asked about fertilizing plants. We talked about pesticides. Mm -hmm. um, yes or no, best time of the day. Oh yeah, so fertilizing, fertil, uh, fertilizers, um, again, looking at the ingredients of your fertilizer, there's some that are maybe a little bit more toxic to other insects that are in the soil. Um, again, fertilizing is good for your plants as long as you know what type of soil that you have. Sometimes you can buy like potting soil that already has fertilizer in it and it's good. Um, and also like listening to your plants. So. I, anyone has read um, less, is it called less, Lessons from Plants? But she talks about like listening to your plants. So your plants will show you if they have mineral deficiencies, if they need more light, if um, they have pests eating them. Um, so kind of like listening to what your plants need before just like adding a ton of fertilizer to your soil. Um, but that is again, on like case to case basis on like what kind of soil you're using, what kind of plants you have, um, all that jazz. I hope that helped a little bit. So I see that somebody has, um, Carrie has answered the question that um, the stinging nettles, for example, um, will host red admirals. 
Oh, sweet. Um, so um, there we have one answer to that. Um, and Patricia, and you know that's Carrie Driehaus, our third member, right? Right, I noticed that as <laughs> well. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Um, somebody asked, uh, Michael asked, I've heard that if you do not keep uh, bee nest wooden tubes clean, it can be worse for them as that can spread disease. Is that yeah. true? Yeah, so if you're using like those pre-made bee houses, um, they do, they'll build up some bad fungi and bacteria. I mean, something's going in and out and like leaving their eggs and food in there. So it can build up on fungi and bacteria. So cleaning them out like every year um, in the early spring after things have already emerged can help with the health of them. Um, but using some like natural insect hotels. So like as you're cleaning up in the fall, all those dead branches and dead twigs, if you leave them in a pile, there's pr probably already some beetles that are burring holes in them that other native bees can use. Um, especially if you don't want to like clean it out all the time. And so leaving kind of like a natural shelter for them is also beneficial. But yeah, making sure if you have those like pre-made ones, you got to clean them out. Uh, same with like bird feeders and like hummingbird feeders and stuff, making sure you clean them. Yeah. And um, in case everybody isn't reading the chat line, somebody had asked, is there a place that they can vote, go and view this program? And of course, ch share it. And it will be on our YouTube channel uh, next week sometime. So you can go and see that. You can see the slides. I know I'm going to go back to it because there was a lot of information there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so if you want to, you can stop it take down the notes or whatever. So um, definitely you can go and see it and definitely share it. Uh, lots and lots of comments about how fantastic a program it was and everybody uh, loved it. I have a question if no others are coming in and that is that, um, so you talked about water for mm -hmm. the pollinators, which again was something that I hadn't thought about and the possibility or especially that it needs to be shallow. Mm -hmm. um, what about mosquitoes though? We hear a lot about not having standing water. What's, is that, do they, would your shallow water dishes also attract mosquitoes? And is there an issue with that? Yeah, great question. Um, so those shallow dishes, I find that I'm filling them up every day. So especially when they're that shallow and you've got the rocks, evaporation in of itself is going to evaporate a lot of it if they're small enough. Um, and then again with mosquitoes, um, unfortunately mosquitoes are a problem in our urban areas and a lot of the times they are finding their larva home in your gutters. So clean out your gutters people so you don't have as big of a mosquito problem. And, and yeah, that standing water is a problem, um, but then dumping those out, um, same with like bird baths, making sure you dump them out every like few days. Um, if you don't want that much commitment, and then again, cleaning out your gutters um, is a great way to stop mosquitoes. And I did see a question about um, a neighbor spraying for mosquitoes. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, mosquito Joe, for tsk, tsk, tsk. But um, so we don't have a ton of research on the effects of spraying for mosquitoes on our bees, but we do know that it, it is harmful to a lot of the beneficial insects. So if they're getting sprayed with these chemicals, we know that they're taking it back to their larva. They could be putting it on their bodies where they're transporting pollen. Um, and so we do know there is an unfortunate uh, impact to other beneficial insects. So again, that champion of a community, right? Um, leading by example, making sure that like, hey, I'm not spraying for mosquitoes. Um, instead, I can help you clean up. I don't know if you want to help your neighbor clean out their gutters, but being like, hey, there's some things that you can do to help uh, mediate from not getting mosquitoes as much. And then at the end of the day, we can um, kind of come together to be like, hey, let's make our own community um, a little bit healthier for all of our pollinators. So yeah. And then I do see that uh, someone has stated that they have a moss fountain this that their awesome. bees love. And oh. the base is lava rock with water running through it. And oh, the yeah. entire thing is covered with green moss. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, the moss, like they can drink, ah, that's perfect. They're not drowning. They can just like smooch up on some soft moss and get some water. That is excellent. And they love running water as well. So that like fresh resource. Um, yeah, you don't have to worry about mosquitoes or them drowning. That is excellent. That's actually really cool. I want to see a picture of that. <laughs> that sounds so cool. 
So I had a, a question about another non-favorite insect of mine. You mentioned wasps. What about hornets? Are they pollinators? Yeah, so we Ohio actually has one species of hornet. Um, and again, they're visiting their flowers for nectar to help fuel the adults and they're bringing meat back for their young. Um, so it's kind of weird that their young are such carnivores and the adults are these like energy drinking like sweethearts. But yeah, so because hornets and social wasps are taking care of their young, right, they're putting all their energy and resource into feeding their young, protecting them, they're going to have stingers and they're going to be a little bit more aggressive. Um, but again, they're aggressive if you're like, I, like as a beekeeper, all the times I got stung, I deserved it because I was messing around with them. I was in their area. I was digging around, messing with their young. And they're like, hey, like, stop. I'm telling you to stop. So same thing with wasps. Um, I found but a majority of our wasp species in Ohio are solitary. They're non-aggressive. They're just out here trying to look for food for their young and kind of be on their way. So, um, but yeah, we only have like, like one species of hornet, but yeah. Somebody else has asked as, are, is neem oil harmful to pollinators? Mm, that's a, oh, I, that does, Jenny or Carrie might know that one better because I have heard of neem oil and I don't think so. Um, Carrie on here? Question. Carrie might know better than I do. I know neem oil is used um, to repel insects, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure what the science is behind killing them and harming them. So it's often put on, and it is, it is a natural oil, a natural occurring oil, like poison ivy oil is naturally occurring, for instance, right? Um, but it is an irritant. So um, the, there is another really interesting question um, from Nancy Clark that she's, she's asking for advice about what to say to neighbors who, who do spray herbicides and maybe pesticides. She just said herbicides. Um, do you want to take that, Sil? Oh, yeah. Um, sometimes it's uncomfortable to talk to somebody. I know, like an injured, like I don't want to knock on my neighbor's door and be like, hey, what's up? Um, but also putting, so when if you have a pollinator garden, um, putting up signage. So if you go to like the, so Cincinnati Zoo's pollinator program, you can actually register your pollinator garden and they'll send you a sign that says like, my garden is registered with the Cincinnati Zoo. And you put that signage up and it's like, hey, the zoo supports my garden and you're going to spray and now you're harming the insects that the zoo supports. So kind of like putting up some, like getting the backing of a whole institution is kind of nice. Um, especially if like conversation kind of seems tough, but if it's like, Hey, I'm using my space as, um, an ecological like resort. If I'm using it as a safe space for pollinators, um, your pesticides and your chemicals can run off into my yard. They can have effect on all the hard work I'm doing. Um, so that's also kind of a way, and also we're like rewarding good behavior, right? Like, hey, I noticed you haven't sprayed for pesticides this year yet. That's really great. Thank you for not doing that. Um, that's a little trick I like to use in classes. Like, instead of, no, 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 don't do that. It's, hey, look at this person sitting really quietly. So kind of rewarding good behavior, like good job on not spraying pesticides, like wink, wink, um, kind of making them feel good about not doing it just so yet so and then if they do have to spray them again giving them them those tips right only spraying at night if you have to spray for weeds you, um, spraying directly at the root of that like at the base of that plant versus like just full-on spraying everywhere um is going to be better um telling them again to like cover it at night um and trying to use more natural methods um but yeah it's kind of some of the some of the tips so, so uh, Carrie did add, and I want to read it because people watching on YouTube won't be able to see the chats, mm -hmm. that some premixed neem oils include other insecticides and can be toxic mm -hmm. for pollinators. Neem oil on its own in small amounts is safe for pollinators, and she's pretty sure it's not safe for aquatic animals, so avoid using it where it might run into waterways. Perfect. Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> so I want to thank the folks from Queen City Pollinator Project and especially Sylvana for the Nature Boss for uh, such a wonderful program this evening and thank our audience for joining us. I want to invite you to check out our other programs by going to our YouTube channel 
and to join us for our next program, Cincinnati Wine and Effervescent History. And you can find out more about that program um, on our website, lloydlibrary.org, or on our Facebook page. So thank you again, and have a great evening. Good night.